Next up on This Week in Law, we've got Travis Romando, Brandon Weiner, and Evan Brown joining us, and lots of great stuff to talk about. We're going to look at Google Drive's terms of service, a new case on the first sale doctrine going to the Supreme Court. We're going to look at CISPA, which just passed the House. And when can an employer get to porn on your personal computer? All that and more next on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. And with for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell, episode 159, recorded April 27, 2012. Too sexy for his bench. Enhance your workflow, send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile, brought to you by Citrix. Try ShareFile today. I have a great offer to get you started. A 30-day free trial, plus get double storage. To get this great offer, visit ShareFile.com, click the radio microphone, and enter my promo code, Twill. Hi, and you've tuned in for This Week in Law. We're so glad to have you. We've got a great panel, two really interesting folks from the University of Michigan Law School, recent grads from there, who have forged out to form something called Creative Rights, uh, where they are representing entrepreneurs and artists in a nonprofit kind of way. So we'd love to welcome to the show Travis Romando from Creative Rights. Hi, Travis. Hi, how's it going, Denise? It's going really well. Great to see you. Thanks for coming on with us. Good to be here. Also joining us from Creative Rights and from just across the room from Travis, <laughs> they do work together, is Brandon Wiener. Hello, Brandon. Hi, Denise. Great to be here. Great to see you. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? I should inquire before we go too much further. Um, some people say Wiener, some people say Weiner. What do you Fine, say? Anyway. That would be the My most important. I say Weiner. Weiner. All right. So Brandon Weiner is joining us also from Creative Rights. Great to have hey, you thank, guys. Thanks for the clarification. I thought you were asking if it was Brandon or Brandone. I didn't Brandone. know what you were talking about. I yeah. get that too. I put <laughs> yeah. Brandone. Moet a Brandone. <laughs> Uh, oh, you saw there too. Evan Brown is joining us from Hinshaw and Culbertson in Chicago. Hello, Evan. Great to have you happy, back. F- yes, happy Friday. Good to be back. Looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, me too. Hey, uh, Travis, I'll tap you to tell us a little bit about Creative Rights and uh, your organization, why you guys founded it, and what you're doing there. Uh, sure. Um, Creative, Creative Rights, Rights is a nonprofit uh 501c3 tax exempt uh, legal organization and our mission is to uh, provide free uh, legal services uh, to the creative community as well as educational programs and um, other business services Um, and I say uh, the creative community and not just artists specifically Um, the artists are part of the creative community as a whole but uh, the creative community encompasses everyone who you know engages in some sort of creative activity which goes far beyond artists these days uh could go to um people who work in new media bloggers and such and uh, so we wanted to be a little bit more inclusive uh beyond just saying artists we uh we serve the creative community uh brandon did you want to uh, mention a little, little something else about uh, Uh, yeah, sure. Um, sorry, a little delay there. But uh, so we're a legal organization, um, but we also see ourselves as a sanctuary for social imagination. And this is a concept from Alvin Poffler uh, in a book he wrote, Future Shock, in the mid 70s. And the book was about um, the pace of technological change and struggles that a so- society has in, in coming up with imaginative solutions to social problems. He advocated for uh, establishing imaginatic centers, centers, excuse me, in communities um, all across the country. And these would be places where uh, people would be free to come up with sort of 
creative, imaginative, social uh, solutions to sort of dream about um, possible future realities. Uh, the people that would come into these centers could be uh, parking lot attendants, dancers, athletes, artists, musicians, uh, lawyers, scientists, and and this is what Toffler meant as a uh, sanctuary for social imagination. And we've tried to take some philosophies and put them into our own organization with what we call uh, our Imaginarium. And we have uh, a couple of projects just to give you sort of a sense of an idea of what we mean by this. But we have, uh, we have a client from Detroit, an artist collective called North End Studios. And they had a nine story building, these are young artists. They had a floor of uh, performance space, a floor of gallery space, a floor of low rent artist studios. And we came in to help them because they're looking to expand uh, to the other five floors. And they had really crazy out there ideas, really cool ideas about some things to do with this space uh, that would help the community in Detroit and would be available for um, almost anyone to use. And this, they had uh, an architectural floor, um, an entrepreneur level, uh, youth advocacy level, uh, legal level. And so we've been working to help them sort of make this dream uh, become a reality. We also worked with an architecture student who uh, was doing a project in Detroit, a public sculpture. And you realize that Detroit, the standard uh, situation or setup for architectural projects didn't quite fit in Detroit. You have this holy trinity of your uh, contractor, your owner, and uh, your architect. And what he realized in Detroit is, at least in the types of uh, smaller community neighborhood settings, you don't really have people who fulfill this owner role. And so we were involved uh, with him in setting up a, a different sort of business model that would be a corporation where you didn't necessarily have an architect at the top. Uh, the community would be shareholders in the corporation and it would be uh, a development corporation that would stay in the community to help not just on this one project, but to bring in future projects. And something that might be a little more relevant to just the legal field as a whole uh, are our efforts looking at, uh, I guess you could say, artificial intelligence. Um, we're not trying to create a sentient being or anything like that, but um, we're looking more at pushing the limits of computers and programs' ability to reason, specifically legal reasoning. And in our case, we're looking at how we can help consumers. And we're looking right now at, at developing an application that'd be able to answer uh, complex fair use questions. Great. Thanks so much for bringing us up to speed on that. Um, I'm really fascinated that you guys decided to do this right out of law school and wish you great luck with your endeavors. It's uh, you. something that's going to be interesting Thanks. to uh, watch unfold. Um, what else has been unfolding in Washington, sort of late breaking news before the show here? Uh, CISPA was actually supposed to come up for a vote today. But uh, through various procedural machinations yesterday, it got voted on in the House and passed. Now it's headed to the Senate. President Obama has said he will veto it unless it is substantially changed. And it doesn't look like it has changed very substantially, at least not in the way the administration has wanted it to. Uh, for ho folks who haven't been paying too close attention to what CISPA is, it is a cybersecurity bill uh, the main crux of which is to encourage um, private corporations and organizations to share information with the government and to give them immunity. Uh, and the information that the government is hoping to have shared um, are things related to attacks, um, hacking instances, breaches of security, that kind of thing. Um, people are really, really unhappy with CISPA. They think that um, by immunizing the organizations involved, um, it allows them to be sloppy with information because they know that um, even if they are un uh, not careful enough um, and there are 
things that are provided that are overbroad for what the government needs. It's not going to matter because they're not going to be held accountable for it. There are all kinds of other issues with the bill, uh, reasons why it's been attacked um, and reasons why the administration has said, you know, this just isn't what we need. Yes, we need some solution to this problem, but this isn't it. So, Evan, have you been following this? And uh, what do you think is going to happen with CISPA? I've been following it. And, uh, you know, I I hear that the president says he's going to veto it. I don't know if the changes that were being made all the way up until the 11th hour will change the administration's mind on that. Um, my overall view on CISPA is to join with those commentators who have said that this is a uh, solution looking for a problem. Uh, Already there are plenty of uh, safeguards in place for privacy that seem to, uh, even if it's cumbersome to go through the process of that that law enforcement needs to go through to get information. Those things are already there to safeguard privacy. So anything like CISPA that's going to make the flow of information um, more easily accomplished seems to be a real threat to that and something that is uh, clearly the the concerns of the the civil libertarian interests are are well founded. You know the EFF has been very vocal in its opposition. The ACLU, of course, and uh, and others. Um, so, I mean, my concern then more specifically comes to the, uh, the the way that it seems so so broad here. And that it's subject to, um, you know, well, it, it actually causes a certain uh, polarization or disruption in the industry that may not be necessary. We've got uh, immunity provided to certain um, providers for sharing information with the government. It seems like that there could develop a marketplace for uh, service providers to say that they are going to stay away from that. And that doesn't seem helpful uh, to the overall uh, interest of of having information shared uh, with the government, so I guess to be to be honest, in the final analysis, I'm waiting to see what happens in the Senate uh, because it, it it my you know the, the impression that I get is that it'll have even more difficulty in the Senate. So, given the fact that the president has said what he says. And the, that the, there appears to be more of an uphill battle in the Senate. I'm not confident that CISPA is going to pass, but um, it's, it's just another way or it's the most current way of, of bringing this issue of, uh, of, of privacy and law enforcement interests into the fore. On the final uh, thing I would want to say about it is I have a feeling that if something like this is ever enacted, uh, it's going to ru- go the way of the Patriot Act, which, as we know, are the amendments to various portions of the of the federal statutes after 9-11. Um, the, the data suggests that law enforcement uses the Patriot Act uh, to pursue the war on drugs. Um, it's something like 100 to, you know, uh, for, every hundred, for every one case of where the Patriot Act has been used to investigate terrorism, there's been something like 100 cases where it's been used in the war on drugs. I have a feeling that any mechanism for the government to get information will be used for, the, uh, for pursuing the investigations of crimes other than terroristic kind of threats or cyber threats or however that term is ultimately going to be defined in the legislation. It'll be used for, for uh, crimes all the way across the board uh, outside of the scope of what it's originally used for. And so that, that gives me a reason to not really like the, the idea of a statute that uh, is so politically charged uh, or that lends itself to such political rhetoric in the passage of it. Uh, I know that it's almost inevitable that law enforcement will use it in, in a different way, but that's, uh, I guess, par for the course when we see these type of enforcement mechanisms put in place. So um, I don't know what to think of CISPA, but uh, you know, it seems like things are happening whether uh, whether we're aware of them or not. One thing I think about when I think of CISPA is the, sort of the classic TV drama, cop drama, where there's a snitch and the prosecutor goes to them and says, okay, you know, we're going to protect you um, and tell us all you know about the mafia guys you're working for or what have you. You know, it's the, that kind of an immunity scenario and the the justifications for the immunity are kind of similar. I mean, you want to get the information, um, yeah, but the wrong that the snitch did is somewhere lower on the order of things that we care about 
than the really bad guys you're trying to get to. Um, so I guess that's the answer to, is this a solution looking for a problem? Uh, the, the problem is we, the government needs to get this information somehow and, you know, it needs to have its snitches come forward and feel comfortable. Uh, Brandon, do you feel like uh, there's any hope of that happening in a way that's not overbroad legislation as everyone seems to feel this one is? I I don't know. It's hard to um, see a legislative solution that would really be narrowly ta- tailored, excuse me, and, and speak to the interests of, um, you know, the public interest as much. I think that one of the things with, with this bill is, um, have been referred to is that we, we do have measures in place already. And granted, um, things like ECPA, you know, they're not ideal, but they are there and, and they, they work to, you know, some extent, at least a, a, a pretty good extent. Um, I think uh, what you bring up is interesting. It's more, it's, it's maybe just more of an issue of, of politics and constituents. And is, is there ever way, a way to have a bill about um, that's so loaded about cybersecurity, national security, um, that's not just going to be uh, full of rhetoric or or sort of blow one uh, interest group's you know desires out of proportion in in the final stage of the bill. And just from from the consumer standpoint, um, it's it's just hard to get bills that really speak to consumers. I think there are a lot of other interests, and uh, from the consumer side, you're always going to hear complaints that. You know, private parties uh, have bigger interests. Government entities have interests. You know, interests that consumers tend to sort of be on the losing end of a lot of the time. Travis, what do you think about CISPA? Um, I think it's sort of uh, sort of an unusual turn for me uh, to uh, uh, just CISPA in general to uh, have the approach. Uh, that the policing is going to kind of be um, contributed uh, by by pri- private entities, um, and um, it, it's an unusual uh, thing to me because uh, I mean most of the time when we think of our privacy being invaded, it's uh, it's from this uh, from the government from from Big Brother, but like having this collaborative aspect from outside uh, from 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 businesses and other private parties uh, kind of collaborating with the government or at least uh, what CISPA seems to uh, uh, be able to facilitate and uh, make easier uh, just seems a bit unusual to me. Um, And um, I mean, uh, there's of course, like it it brings back issues of privacy and big brother into the fray, but uh, um, it just concerns me that we tend to forget uh, that the everyday powers that have been kind of granted gradually over the years to the government to uh, to kind of monitor us and invade our privacy over the years. Evans mentioned the Patriot Act, and um, it just hasn't been big news. Um, but uh, of, of course, uh, of course, it was kind of under the news radar that uh, that certain provisions of the Patriot Act, uh, such as the controversial uh, library provision, which allows uh, the government under the, the guise of a uh, guise of a um, security investigation just to access anyone's library records or um, or uh, business records, um, you know, with no notice, um, that that was extended, you know, to 2015, uh, just last year. And so, you, you know, it just concerns me that, 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 uh, that people aren't paying a little bit more attention to that. I guess it's good in, in some ways that, that CISPA brings back all these issues to the fray, but uh, I just feel like uh, in general, people aren't paying enough attention to, uh, to the, the power uh, that the government already has. Well, it seems to me there's enough opposition to this. And certainly when the White House comes out and says they're going to veto something, uh, there's either going to be a whole lot of change or or the bill's not going to go through. Um, so we'll keep watching, see what the Senate does with it. Um, and look at right now some maybe more optimistic, happy legislation that just got passed, uh, the JOBS Act. 
um, which even has a happy name, although um, <laughs> only sort of, only sort of uh, indirectly related to actual jobs. Um, I guess the, the tie-in for jobs with the Jobs Act is that if we have lots and lots of entrepreneurial efforts going forth, that means that more and more people are going to be finding employment uh, more with small startup kind of opportunities rather than big corporate ones. And, you know, maybe that's um, certainly great for the, the people who can put that together, great for the economy. Um, so that what the Jobs Act does is uh, a number of things. It changes the securities laws um, so that, it, just to put this very, very generally, it's easier for small companies to get funding and they don't have to um, comply with what have been historically very, very stringent disclosure requirements to be able to offer um, equity to shareholders. So there's a portion of the Jobs Act that involves crowdfunding, which is really, really interesting. Um, I'm excited to see what people are going to do with this. It's sort of a Kickstarter-like idea where people can put their money into companies they believe in, but instead of getting back an e-paper watch, uh, they're going to get equity in that company. Um, and there are some limits to how much companies can raise in this way. Um, it really is designed for um, smaller types of funding opportunities, but uh, it's really, really cool um, if that's the field that you're in. And uh, Travis, I take it this is something that um, a lot of your clients might be looking at to take advantage of. Do you think? Uh, most certainly. But uh, I had another comment about the, the Jobs Act in, in so far as it helps uh, creative rights and uh, nonprofit organizations uh, personally. And, um, and I, I feel like the whole idea of uh, crowdfunding, um, I mean, the idea taken from uh, Internet websites such as Kickstarter is, is cool. Uh, but maybe the Jobs Act didn't go far enough in extending the sort of uh, crowdfunding options and, uh, and, and exceptions uh, to the nonprofit sector. I know, mm -hmm. um, I know we would be uh, a nonprofit organization like us, uh, like Creative Rights, would be benefited if uh, we were able to use uh, crowdsourced funding, uh, you know, especially go on to Kickstarter. You go to Kickstarter and um, they, uh, if, if you notice, one of the provisions is that uh, – Charities can't use uh, Kickstarter, and um, you know that that comes from uh, that comes from the fact that uh, you know states regulate uh, charities very strictly. Um, there, there's a lot of concern about uh, fraud uh, from charities, and um, if you want to uh, start a national fundraising campaign, or if any any nonprofit wants to start a national fundraising campaign, um, you know it's highly suggested that they register from state to state, which becomes uh, tremendously impractical for, um, for uh, just small startup nonprofits um, to have to register with every state to do so. Um, and so what, you know, um, while, the, 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 while, while crowdfunding uh, is, is tremendously helped in the private sector, I, I did not, from the Jobs Act, I, I did not see anything there uh, that, that helped a, a a uh, startup like ours, like Creative Rights, which is a nonprofit organization, and um, perhaps, uh, perhaps, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Washington should pay attention to that. You're you're absolutely right, um, and maybe you guys should think about whether uh, nonprofit status is is really the best thing. You have something against making a profit? Oh uh, well. Just because, uh, again, you're a nonprofit organization does not mean that you uh, can't, can't create, uh, that you can't get money. Uh, that's, mm. a, uh, that's a misconception uh, generally about uh, nonprofit organizations. It just means that uh, revenue can't be distributed uh, in, in certain ways. Um, but uh, uh, th this takes me to just the, the general um, topic of... Uh, me as a uh, as a recent law school grad having to uh you know look at other options and um having to be creative in the kind of ventures that I go into i mean um the the class of 2011 uh was was hit pretty hard and uh, it used to be uh you know just maybe 
five, ten years ago that someone who went to Michigan Law School, you know, instant, instant, uh, instant law firm job or, you know, mm-hmm. instant, uh, instant uh, government, uh, government uh, law job. But um, our class was hit pretty hard uh, by, um, uh, by just uh, uh, law firm downsizing. And um, so, you know, having to be creative with uh, what kind of job options um, were in front of me, uh, going to, you know, nonprofit legal services and, you know, having to be entrepreneurial were... Um, were two things that I wanted or that, that we found a, a viable option. Um, you know, entrepreneurial in that we wanted to create our own jobs and uh, nonprofit in the way that we would benefit uh, from, um, from loan assistance and loan repayment for working in the public sector. Um, that's one of the interesting things in uh, creating uh, an organization like ours that um, – we really wanted to include uh, in our in our job options. Wonderful. Well, I'm sure that uh, that a lot of um, your law class classmates will be taking advantage of uh, the Jobs Act, and and hopefully there will be some opportunities for nonprofits to do something similar in the future. Evan, uh, there's a lot of concern about the JOBS Act loosening up the disclosure requirements that that there's opportunity for fraud and the specter of Enron type kind of debacles in the securities world. Are you concerned about this at all? Um, I'm sure that your clients are probably looking at this as a possible funding vehicle as well. Yes, I have clients who are looking to this as a fund, as a uh, possible means to to be funding uh, funded, um, and yes, I'm concerned uh, as you suggest. Maybe we should be that this is going to open up opportunities for fraud because you know it's just kind of a if you want to look at it from a certain perspective, it's a hall pass for people to all kinds of scammers and shysters and, and other dishonest types to go out and raise a bunch of money for some purpose that may not have a real uh, good basis in reality and certainly is not based on on good business sense. Uh, Along those lines, I think that the sum total effect of the JOBS Act is going to be uh, just to keep things in equilibrium. I don't think it's going to save our economy or create substantial new employment or anything like that. If anything, it may create a bit more uh, total amount of heartache in the world. And, and it's not necessarily for the reasons that I'm talking about now, because it's going to open it up to fraudsters and shysters and con artists and all that stuff. But I think it's going to, um, uh, it's going to enter, uh, and I'm not the one who's first to come up with this critique of it. I'm getting this from other sources, but I'm just kind of joining along with this. If more people are going to be available to invest in companies, even small amounts, more people thereby are going to be introduced to the idea that most businesses fail. And despite the promise, this mythos that we have of the great American dream of entrepreneurship, uh, the vast majority of businesses that start fail and many fortunes are lost in pursuing ideas that never come to fruition and certainly never turn a profit. Um, so, th- what I mean, what's what's key to entrepreneurial success is good execution, the development of ideas that are uh, executed in a way that uh, is meaningful and is done efficiently uh, on good business sense. Uh, businesses don't succeed because you throw a lot of money at them, uh, or because a lot of different people are throwing money at them. So the factor that is not going to change because of the JOBS Act is the presence or absence of good business sense and savvy on the part of the entrepreneurs who are actually the ones sticking their necks out to to, uh, undertake these ventures. What we're going to see is just kind of a spreading out, a, a wider distribution of the dismay that happens when the vast majority of businesses that intend to get off the ground uh, fail. And, you know, as I'm listening to what I've been saying, you know, I'm, I guess I'm sounding pretty cynical. I'd like to think it's just more of a realistic picture of entrepreneurship, uh, uh, seeing that the, the, the ways that, uh, you know, startups can be more successful, business in general can be more successful is through sound execution of 
plans and principles rather than just going out and getting money as the first step uh, in, the, uh, in, in the equation. That's why I wish, uh, wish my clients would focus more on execution rather than seeking uh, to get money. But uh, I've had successful clients and I've also had plenty of clients fail despite the fact that uh, I'm, I'm giving them the best legal counsel that I possibly can given their, their factual scenario. The best legal counsel available, no doubt. Uh, so. Yeah, well, I tried to qualify it a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wait, way to throw cold water on the Jobs Act, Evan. <laughs> we won't but be talking let's... about the Jobs Act this time next year. Like, just like we're not talking about Bitcoin, you know. Bitcoin. Anymore. I don't know. Mm-hmm. We won't be talking about the Jobs Act. You don't think that people are going to um, actually run with this new opportunity, or you think that the, all the people who do will just get discouraged and and. Therefore, there yeah. will be no investment this way. Um, I mean, there will be some investment, but people will mm-hmm. fail at the same proportion that they're failing now. It's kind of the point I'm trying to make. And so it's not mm-hmm. going to revolutionize things. It's just going to take things. To the, it's going to play out the scene of entrepreneurship and successful and failing businesses just on a larger stage. Actually, kind of a distorted stage. You've still got the same number of people probably starting up businesses, roughly. Maybe there will be more entrepreneurs that come in because they can get all the people on the streets to come in and crowdfund this stuff. But I have a feeling that, that, that the, the people who want to be entrepreneurs are going to find ways of being entrepreneurs, whether they can get a thousand people that they don't know to invest or whether they can raise the capital themselves and get a couple of good uh, friends to, uh, to invest. I don't think that's going to change the overall, overall calculus of things. But uh, I hope I'm wrong because, you know, we could, we could use all the help we can get, right? Yes, absolutely. I see where you're going with that. Um, lest people think that, that the Jobs Act is just going to enable a plethora of springtimes for Hitler to flourish, you know, the producers, Mel Brooks classic <laughs> film and then Broadway show, um, there, there are even built into the act safeguards um, that prevent people from just scooping up your money and absconding with it. Uh, the um, p- principles of the companies in question Um, are going to be held personally liable for any failure of material disclosure as to the risks and information about their business enterprises. And of course, you know, there are other separate safeguards in place to keep people from perpetrating wholesale fraud. Uh, Brandon, any thoughts about this act and uh, the ramifications? Where will it be in a year, do you think? Oh, I think I uh, said with Evan on that one. Um, Mm -hmm. I would like to introduce one other element, though, into the whole uh, just investor uh, entrepreneur equation, and that's the role of the community. And um, I think everyone's in search of a way to sort of have this entrepreneurial revolution and great creation of jobs and revitalization. Mm -hmm. Um, But just with our own uh, experience working in Detroit, um, there's, an, there's an organization that's running a program that, uh, there called LISC, L-I-S-C. Uh, it's one of the largest uh, national community development in combined corporate, government, film, philanthropic uh, resources to help community-based organizations uh, and, and revitalize their neighborhoods. And they have like 5 to $10 million that they're going to be putting into specific neighborhoods over the next five years in Detroit. And in they're, they're giving loans, uh, um, sometimes uh, almost totally forgivable loans, uh, if everything works out, uh, to business owners and just different entrepreneurial projects. But what's a little different is that it is a very coordinated effort that um, all goes through the community, and it's, it's run through existing community organizations who are able to identify need and, and evaluate the quality of pro, uh, projects. And they actually let the community vote on, on projects they would like to come in. And so some of the things they do are um, they, they enable people to purchase uh, land, sometimes for uh, existing, even with existing buildings or adding onto structures. Um, so with improvements, parking lots, landscaping, modernizing, renovating, and um, these are things where it's all, um, I guess, maybe a little more more tangible where the money's going to the community and the types of, of startup efforts there. All right. Well, I really want to um, get around to talking about Google Drive, which is being rolled out this week. Uh, but before I do that, I want to talk about a new sponsor for This Week in Law, which is ShareFile. 
And talking about Google Drive is going to be a great sort of counterpoint to what ShareFile is all about. ShareFile is the solution that Google Drive is trying to offer, except for without the problems of worrying about how your data is going to be used and whether it's going to be secure. Um, the problem that Google Drive, or that I'm sorry, that uh, ShareFile is solving, um, it are there are several problems that it's solving. Uh, first of all, we've all had the problem where there's a file that's too big to attach to an email and you've got to get it off to your client or your colleague somehow. Um, and so there are other solutions out there, Google Drive being one of them, Dropbox being another, that people can use, but they've all had their are issues uh, with terms of service and security, various other things that just don't make them a good business solution. Of course, in our line of work uh, where we're counseling clients, a confident confidentiality is a very, very big deal. And we really need to make sure that we're doing that securely. Um, also, the other thing that ShareFile helps you address is being out of the office and not having access to whatever spreadsheet or PowerPoint presentation that is back on your work computer, ShareFile will help you address all those things. Unlike other services, ShareFile was designed for business use, so it's professional and it allows you to send files of almost any size, access your file from any computer or a mobile device, and so it easily enhances your workflow. There are a couple of specific things I wanna point out about ShareFile. Uh, first of all, for business cases, tons and tons of businesses are on the Windows platform. They use Microsoft Outlook. They can't really exist without it. There is an Outlook plugin that works like a little bookmarklet in your browser would work. It just becomes part of the Outlook interface uh, that enables you to insert links to your share file documents directly into your email to upload and send new files and to request files from the person that you've sent an email to, and it'll all go through the share file system and be absolutely secure and confidential. Um, the other thing I really, really like about how share file works is it gives very fine grained permissions for who can do what to whatever file that you need to share, um, who can access it, who can edit it. Uh, you get to tweak that to your heart's content and make sure that it's exactly right. Uh, the other thing I love is the um, app universe that ShareFile has provided uh, iOS and Android apps for accessing all of its features. So when you're on the go, you can literally have access to everything that you need and do all your work and use the ShareFile functionality to make sure that your clients are right in there getting to whatever you need to have them see, no matter what size it is. And they're doing so in a completely secure manner. Uh, the other thing that I love about it, uh, it's just kind of a, a detail that makes it a really nice, again, business solution as opposed to something that you might pick up for free on the web, uh, is that you can tweak the interface that you're presenting to clients to incorporate your logo. It can look just like your firm or business website so that it's a seamless experience for the people that you're working with. They know that they're in a business environment, even though ShareFile is providing the back end. It's also from the people at Citrix who know all about providing these kinds of services in a business professional way. So we have a very special offer for the folks who are watching This Week in Law. Uh, we're going to give you, they're going to give you a 30-day free trial plus double storage. So you just have to try this out today. In order to get that special offer, you go to sharefile.com, you click on the radio microphone and enter this show's promotional code, TWIL, TWIL. Remember, visit sharefile.com and type in TWIL. I promise you're going to love it. All right, so let's talk about Google Drive as a sort of a contrast to our sponsor. Um, Google Drive is a file sharing kind of uh, add-on uh, update to Google Docs uh, where things are going to be uploaded and downloaded from your computer and made available in the cloud. People are very concerned, however, that uh, Google's overarching terms of service are making this kind of a dicey proposition. Um, there are, as we know, Google altered its terms of service in March to try and 
provide a uniform privacy policy for all of its uh, various aspects and services. And as I look at this, I'm seeing, you know, how this could maybe be a bad idea. You know, we, we like that things are simplified, but different services operate in different ways. And when you upload a video to YouTube, I think you might have some different expectations than when you upload business documents to Google Docs and share them using Google Drive. Uh, Evan, have you looked at this controversy and, and do you think Google's got a problem here? I looked at the controversy and decided that it wasn't much of a controversy and nothing to be too afraid of if Mike Masnick at TechDirt, of all people, is going to say, you know, chill out, Internet. It's not that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. in, in a certain sense, this is just the latest incarnation of the same kind of privacy and intellectual property licensing brouhaha's that happen um, Actually, they happen every time I use the word brouhaha on Twill. I only use the <laughs> word brouhaha in situations like this because it's in response to some kind of freak out uh, over the introduction of a new service. And people take the time then to look at what the terms of service say. And um, I, I guess it, it boils down to the fact that there's not too much to be concerned about here. I mean, there's this broad license that Google gets in the content that you store or upload to the drive service, the drive platform or whatever, uh, however we want to characterize it as a, as a service. Um, you know, to, there's this license that they have to do whatever they, they need to do in order to provide the service. And then there's, it goes on a little bit further to say something like, well, we can also do whatever we need to do to, or, you know, what we want to promote the services or something like that. The most fundamental thing here and the most important thing here is that there are market forces at work. Google is not going to take people's spreadsheets or their private photos or whatever and use those to, to you know, market Google, to make that a billboard for Google or a television ad or, or whatever. So there's, there's always that kind of final clamp down uh, when, when it comes to this stuff. Um, you know, with, you know with, when it comes to real concerns about privacy, <clears throat> I'm not sure we should ever feel like we have that much security and privacy in the information we upload to um, intermediaries to, well, I guess I'm not really an inter What is it an intermediary in this role? I'm, I'm just throwing out that word, you know, a, a cloud provider. I'm not sure that we should ever really have that much sense of security in the information that's there because the Fourth Amendment jurisprudence is really unsettled when it comes to the, the question of whether or not we have a, a real privacy interest, a reasonable expectation of privacy in that uh, in, in the first place. And in fact, the case law that we do have, which talks about the third party doctrine, would suggest that we, you know, we don't have any kind of reasonable expectation of privacy in information that's with a, with a provider in the first place. You know, we look at the old cases and when I say old, I mean 1980s, uh, cases about banks and, you know, whether or not your financial records that are stored by the bank are subject to Fourth Amendment protection, you know, that you have an expectation of privacy. And the court said that it ain't, that it information isn't uh, subject to the same kind of Fourth Amendment thing. So, I mean, I'm just, I'm just batting around this issue ad nauseum that there's, there's, there's really no clear expectation of privacy in the beginning if somebody is going to send a subpoena to a, a third-party provider like Google in, in, you know, in the drive service the 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 question of whether or not that third party provider is just going to willy nilly disclose your information to third parties because it has permission to ostensibly in the terms of service or whether it's going to use it in a way that you don't want that to me seems much much more subordinate to the more important question of you know what obstacles or what impediments stand in the way of somebody getting at your information who wants to get at that information and they have the means to do so through regular legal proceedings, whether that be the government sending a, a warrant or a subpoena or a 2703D order under the Stored Communications Act or just your opponent in civil litigation sending a subpoena to Google saying, hey, turn over all the documents that you have that relate to that. Google, you know, there's not going to be many arguments that you have um, that are that are particularly novel because it's a cloud based uh, uh, cloud based provider. So that's that's the way I look at the at the concern on this. I'm not um, uh, Drive does not really raise any new concerns for me that I didn't have before I ever heard about Drive a few weeks ago. It raises a hypocrisy concern for me um, because we've got Google on the one hand spending record amounts in Washington on its lobbying 
uh, urging that things like CISPA and other bills that um, it wants to weigh in on be narrowly tailored to their proper purpose and not overbroad so that, so as to sweep in things that the government doesn't really need or would never really intend to do, but why include it in there? If they're going to argue for that, I'd like to see them start treating their terms of service the same way. And, and you know, whether it's um, the rollout of a new service that causes people to go in and take a closer look or not, um, you know, I think it's good. Whatever the, the triggering mechanism is that people are looking and critiquing and saying, hey, Google, I never authorized you to use my spreadsheet to um, promote your services, uh, even though it says so right here, that's counter to uh, what my expectations were anyway. And, you know, I've, I think your point is a good one, Evan, that market forces are going to keep them from doing that. But given that that's the case, why not just um, acknowledge it in the terms of service? Brandon, have you looked at this? Yeah, um, I think to your point just about expectations, Google in particular, um, I mean, has a somewhat bad record on privacy recently uh, with uh, Google Buzz, Google Maps, Google Books. Um, not to say that all you know all the sort of larger companies don't have run in Facebook, Twitter have had their share too. Um, but I I think um, especially with this the master policy when it first came out, uh, it took a request from Congress to get Google to admit that what this change was also allowing would be. Um, Say, for example, if you did a search online for um, cooking recipes just through Google and then you were uh, browsing on YouTube, they would show you, you know, videos for cooking that they, that they would be collecting, you know, these information from different places on users and, and putting them in other spots that, you know, usually you see Gmail. Things are, are, are self-contained or whatever in the, in the ads that would come through the email. But so... The problem is, you know, what are what are your expectations from what they're saying? But also, you know, what are the expectations about what they're not saying? Um, we don't we don't always know what's what's actually happening and, and have to go to extreme measures to get that information out of the companies. Uh, the other point I'd like to make is that I I love Google. I, I use all Google products and I, I guess I just enjoy <laughs> doing so. But um a lot of other companies have very similar policies. Um, Dropbox in particular had one that, that drew some criticism. They've revised theirs, and it seems to be much more consumer-friendly. But uh, the Microsoft SkyDrive and um, especially the Apple's I, iCloud uh, terms are, are, are much worse. They're much more restrictive. I mean, Apple... Uh, they reserve the right to remove content, not just that infringes other people's copyright, just that they deem otherwise uh, objectionable. So I think it just comes down to, uh, at the end of the day, who you want to use and, and who you trust, because they're all, I mean, as Evan was referring to before, I mean, if someone wants to come in and force them to share information, they're going to have to anyways. The bottom line I heard was that don't upload your porn collection to Apple. <laughs> That's all I say. It's, it's okay everywhere else. Did I say that out loud? Darn. That's what I heard. <laughs> uh, over on The Verge, Neelai Patel has a good uh, comparison article for Google Drive, uh, iCloud, SkyDrive, and Dropbox, comparing all the terms from a privacy standpoint. Uh, Travis, have you looked at... at what, another thing people are complaining about is, is the way in which... Um, uh, the new uh, Google Drive is going to be governed by Google's overarching terms that provide that uh, your arrangements, your agreements with them will survive the termination of your Google account, um, that the license will survive. Uh, do you have a problem with that? Do you think it should uh, have more of a, you know, everything comes to an end when you close your account? I mean, uh, just generally speaking, going along with what uh, Evan said, um, when it comes to just certain bits and pieces that I want to pick at whenever there's a new change in policy or change of term service in, in anything, I, I, I tend to just <laughs> almost ignore it because uh, – 
because things uh, do tend to get smoothed out in time. Um, but as for uh, Google having this in perpetuity kind of um, kind of license or kind of permission to uh, to use your uh, use what your information or um, uh, as you stated um, on, on the face of it, th- there's a problem. Uh, but you know, I I still would not know how to address it. Uh, the um, uh, the terms of service, um, uh, as, as I've read about, do contain a provision that that state that um, you still continue to to own uh, any intellectual property rights, even though um, Google could um, you know do do what it likes with those uh, uh, with, with that intellectual property. Um, so presumably, there's you know maybe something there that could be invoked in in, in, uh, in reclaiming you know my my uh, my property that I upload to Google. But again, um, I just haven't concerned myself that much with uh, with with all these changes. I, I tend to be jaded since there there seems to be as Evan state of brouhaha every time some some new provision comes up. There you right. Said it. It's. It's worth noting, I mean, for people who pay attention to terms of service, Google used to have a provision. It was a uh, subparagraph part 13.1234 and 5. <laughs> for anyone who's particularly interested, I had to dig around in Google's cache in order to find it. It's still there. Um, that talked about ending your relationship with Google specifically. Um, and that is now gone from their as of the March revision to their terms. So I, I remember thinking in the past that it was nice that it was there. It was a good dovetail with its data portability um, kind of approach. And uh, now it's gone. So, you know, I'm not sure what all the ramifications of that are. It's just worth noting that that there was a change there. And it just seems to me like, um, once again, there's, there's less attention being paid to... Um, having this be narrowly tailored and that, you know, there's some language in there that lets Google do what they conceivably need to do, um, even in unexpected future circumstances. And I don't know. I mean, that's good for Google, but not necessarily great for users. Uh, let's move on to some new developments in, on the copyright front. Um, We've got a case going to the United States Supreme Court that's going to look at the first sale doctrine. This is the doctrine that enables you to buy a CD or a book. And then when you decide that uh, you're going to just have your digital collection, for example, you can take those down to your local reseller and resell them. And there's no copyright violation um, involved in any of that. Uh, So we've got... um, a case going before the Supreme Court that's going to consider whether the first sale doctrine applies when the first sale takes place offshore from the United States in another country. Um, The circuit courts are split on this, and so the Supreme Court's going to take this up and try and decide it. Do you think this is a big deal, Travis? Um, Definitely. Uh, The... There are a couple of interesting things about uh, the particular case. Um, the first of all, the first thing is that um, it actually involves IP. I, I mean, uh, going to the, the John Wiley case that you're talking about, it, it involves a gray market sale of books published outside of the United States and the reimportation back of them into the United States. And looking to the past history of cases, they, you know, kind of didn't involve what you would traditionally think was IP going to. Uh, the, the Quality King v. Lanza case, uh, which had to do with um, the importation of uh, shampoo into the United States, the copyrighted item in question being the labels in shampoo. And the direct predecessor case, which was the, uh, the Omega case, I believe, had to do uh, with the reimportation of watches back into the United States. And again, the copyright uh, issue being that of the logo design on the Omega watch. I think it's really interesting that this gets to the heart of um, of, of the IP matter, which, uh, again, you know, has to do with intellectual property in a book. Uh, this this case won't be construed to um, be a case that had to do with uh, copyright being used as some sort of um, trade restriction. 
or a way to restrict trade. Um, as, as for the, the case itself, um, be beyond uh, its implications on first sale doctrine, um, I, I have a couple of opinions on. And, and the first is that um, I, I, I like that this is actually going to uh, the, the Supreme Court because um, – Hopefully, hopefully it'll it'll start to uh, to answer the question about the the whole doctrine, which I think is it's a little bit. Um, well, Brandon will get me on this, but it, it's it's a little bit antiquated, insofar as um, I mean, uh, looking back to the genesis of the first sale doctrine when it first came up about a hundred years ago, and uh, it was a case to do with uh, books once again. And there's this impression uh, that comes from the first sale doctrine that there's a property right that's somehow tied to the uh, the physical ownership uh, of the embodiment of the intellectual property in in this book and of course like you know I could lend my book to Brandon or or give my book to you Denise and it, it's within our it's just within our thinking that um, that that's the right thing to do uh, but um, it's a little bit out of date because now that intellectual property could be passed on without kind of a tie to any physical property that I can, you know, say is mine. This is my book. This is my record. Um, that uh, for sale doctrine has to be updated to kind of, um, you know, you know, get 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 with the times and uh, and uh, just kind of adjust itself to how IP exists today. It doesn't exist in physical forms. It exists, you know, in easily manipulable and easily transferable forms that, you know, aren't tied to any kind of physical property that I could claim a title to. Right. Unfortunately, this case isn't going to get to reforming the first sale doctrine because it involves a physical item, a book. And so there's not going to be, you know, the opportunity to um, talk about whether the first sale doctrine should should be applied to digital or other non-physical items as well, which is something that comes up a lot uh, and still remains an open question. Brandon, um, what do you think about the, the offshoring of our copyright law that this case um, represents? Do you think it's a good idea for the first sale doctrine to apply to things that were first sold in another country? Uh, well, no, I think, I think it's actually pretty awful for consumers mm -hmm. um, on, a, on a number of accounts. And if the Supreme Court were to adopt the Second Circuit's um, uh, rationale, there could, there could be um, a number of, of really crazy results. Um, so one could just be, I mean, it's, it's undetermined if if this if this were go, if this were to go into full effect, um, how much of an object, or how many parts of an object, would uh, need to be manufactured overseas for the doctrine to kick in? You know, if you have a toy or whatever, you know, a cover of a book, but not the rest of it. Um, when would this kick in? So there could be confusion about um, what products or what works could be sold, or you know, within the first sale doctrine, and um, and this could also uh, encourage um, companies to move their, their manufacturing operations just to take advantage of this loophole uh, if it were to be put in because it would essentially give them, you know, complete control over, um, you know, distribution, secondary distribution of, of their products. And I think also uh, you have to look at um, the way this interpretation might affect other areas of the copyright code. So, for example... Um, section 109C, <clears throat> excuse me, grants the owner of a copy the right to publicly display that copy. So what would, um, you know, large museums with with big uh, kinds of foreign works do or even just businesses, companies displaying foreign works, would they have to take those down? Yeah, it raises all kinds of complicated issues. Evan, what do you think about the the offshore aspect of this, do you see a potential for abuse here? I guess I haven't thought much about that um, because I'm, you know, pretty much uninterested in this case and really surprised that the Supreme Court took it because mm -hmm. of the fact that, 
it's, a, it's very limited to the question of copyright. So the implications would only be toward physical goods that are subject to copyright. And with the transmission or <laughs> transition to, um, you know, more content and technologies being distributed without the uh, use of, uh, you know, an actual physical medium uh, carrying that, you know, it's, it's just really surprising me that the court would take its resources on this. I would be much more excited if we were going to be talking about the principles of first sale. And, you know, another way of talking about it is exhaustion, the exhaustion of the rights, the intellectual property rights at the time of sale. If we were talking about that in the context of trademark or, or even patents, you know, patentable subject matter, you know, widgets, importing widgets, we'll still be using little mechanical widgets, even, uh, um, you know, long after we're a purely digital content uh, society. So, I see the the potential for abuses that would be, I guess you would characterize them as abuses if you're talking about the interest of the consumer. You wouldn't be talking them about them as abuses if you're looking at the interests of the the corporation who's wanting to maximize efficiencies and increase margins and uh, help the bottom line and pass on its wealth to uh, our economy through the you know enrichment of its uh, of its coffers. It would actually be, you know, quite a, quite a benefit to them to maximize those efficiencies and c- control the distribution channels. So, it, it all just depends on how you sl- how you slice it, what what angle you want to look at it. But certainly, does if you know if the if the court does uh, adopt the um, uh, Brandon was saying this, you know, if the court adopts the uh, rationale, the holding of the Second Circuit, there will be more uh, tools in the arsenal of the corporate publishing interests to maximize those types of efficiencies and you know the flip side of that would be would be abuses so yeah it's there but i wonder you know what you know if it's really going to to matter uh, since the holding of this case will be limited to physical goods you know that are subject to copyright and it, it won't necessarily translate over uh, it won't map over completely to uh, you know to, to trademark and cop and uh, patent uh, situations which would be much more intriguing to uh, to have guidance on Okay, well, we'll have to see what the Supreme Court does does with it. We'll keep an eye on it and uh, let you guys know. Uh, I think it's now time for us to armchair quarterback the Oracle versus Google trial a little bit, which has been going on uh, very entertainingly for the last week and a half or so. Uh, Evan, you first. Anything standing out about this trial for you? Um, not, not really. I mean, I'm just excited to see what, what happens. I mean, there, that's, this is a really intriguing question of the, the protectability of, of APIs. So, uh, you know, it, it's obviously really exciting to, to see such high profile people like David Boyes and, uh, uh, you know, other, other lawyers, uh, Who's 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 Google? Oh, uh, the Kecker Van Nest, you know Van Nest for Google Robert and the, Van Nest, the other, right? yeah, um, yeah. The firm is what Kecker Van Nest. It's still called that, mm-hmm. whatever. Um, you know, the, all of these uh, characters uh, playing out and all that. So, um, you know, my I'm trying to see through all that and just kind of get to the 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 real questions here, which uh, of of copyrightability of these uh, API, the the specifications there. Uh, it's going to be uh, significant, uh, you know, uh, significant guidance that we get from from however the uh, however it turns out here. So. Do you have an opinion on that? Do you have, you know, a horse you know, in this I, race? I wish that I understood more what was going on. I mean, I don't uh, know all that much about the nuances of programming in Java or, you know, how these APIs are uh, set out or, you know, you know, precisely what it looks like to get in there and look at the literal elements of what protection is being claimed on. So I would be doing everyone a disservice to be opining on, you know, the ultimate question of copyright protection or whether that should attach here just because I don't fully understand the extent that I should, um, you know, if I were to, to, to go about doing that. But it, 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 uh, it suffice it to say, it seems like whatever is going on there in the in the nuances of all these things it's presenting a metaphysical enough of a question to really make it interesting to see what the outcome's going to be do yeah, you definitely. have an opinion? Have you given it much thought? What do you think? Uh, I, um, I lean toward APIs uh, not being copyrightable, but it's it's a difficult question, and uh, I could certainly entertain arguments on both sides of it. So I think that the court's going to have 
um, a tough time uh, deciding this one. Certainly, <laughs> even maybe understanding it when you go through the explanations that have been offered. I do have a favorite moment from the trial this week, and that is that uh, um, David Boyes has made much, and Oracle's lawyers in general, of Tim Lindholm's email that uh, he thought way back in 2010 that... Uh, that they needed a license to use Java from Sun. Here's an engineer saying, yeah, I think we need a license. Um, but in court, uh, when a witness, and I think it was, let's see, who was on the stand when this happened? Block. Uh, it was Lindholm himself, um, who was asked to offer essentially a legal opinion from the stand uh, and Boyce jumps in and objects that, no, 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 Lindholm lacks the legal expertise to make that kind of call in court. So we can't let him do that. So I think it's, it, and the judge overruled that, but I think it's fun that, you know, they were wanting him to be the legal expert on one hand and, and not on the other. Um, what do you think, Brandon? Any favorite moments or thoughts about the case so far? Uh, yeah, just selfishly, um, I liked uh, Baber's argument for, um, uh, transformative use. I would love to see him win that just to see a uh, president set for transformity, transformativeness, excuse me, uh, through character and not through purpose. All right. How Travis? Are you, how are you? How, well, I was Sorry, go ahead. We, for, how are you going to program your robot to figure out that analysis? How are you going to encode the information semantically so that it can determine whether or not there's any fair use in a situation like this? Did you say that you were going to you're Just, using artificial intelligence to determine fair use a while ago? No, no. Well, yes, yes, but uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's only uh, a half rhetorical yeah, no. question. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's going to be some robot. We'll have a crew hop. Everyone get together, and that's how. <laughs> Travis, any any thoughts on this? APIs, copyrightability, lawyer antics, anything at all? Um. I, uh, there was, uh, on Tuesday, I read the, uh, I read when, uh, Larry Ellison uh, was on the stand and, uh, how he was stating that he wouldn't have spent uh, five billion, you know, dollars toward research and, and development on, on, his, on, 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 uh, Oracle's, uh, API if, you know, he didn't think that, uh, he'd have any financial incentive to, uh, to do. And that, that kind of caught me off guard. I, just had the impression that over from an overall standpoint that uh whether or not uh apis are copyrightable that ultimately just uh you know cross platform compatibility through apis uh was ultimately a good thing whether or not mm -hmm. you wanted to uh consider them uh compatible they just make web 2.0 go around right i mean you raise a good point there there are policy reasons that come into play here aside from a straight interpretation of the copyright law that, you know, I don't know if a trial court is necessarily a place for them to play out. But um, even if the judge decides that the APIs here strictly satisfy the requirements for copyrightability and that an infringement took place, you know, is there is there any room to have some relief from this because obviously if if APIs are capable of copyright infringement, it's going to have a large impact on the way the web as we know it functions. Um, Evan, do you think that that's something that, that is going to come up here or is that something we're going to see down the line maybe at the appellate level? Well, I, I would be, I guess I would would want to comment on on the conclusion that it would have a significant effect on on things if it were found that APIs are copyrightable because it seems like I mean if you look at and I know this isn't a perfect um, it doesn't doesn't uh, you know roll over exactly perfectly for comparison but if you look at Twitter and you know how it has promoted the open API um, the the development of a robust ecosystem because of third party development and all that stuff has happened because of the sensibilities of allowing the open API. The question of the protectability of APIs as copyright doesn't even factor into that equation. So it seems mm -hmm. like there's a norm or an ethos that has spurred the development of the web in such a positive way through the use of open APIs that this whole question is, seems to be somewhat ancillary. Maybe it's about as relevant as whether or not 
paper textbooks sold overseas are, uh, <laughs> you know, subject to the <laughs> first sale doctrine in the U.S. So, I mean, yeah. it, it could have a, an important academic uh, implications, but I would think that you know, we would continue to see robust development because of enlightened views that companies like Twitter take who are managing these APIs. Right. Hey, Evan, I'm going to leave it to you to inject porn into the proceedings as you so often do here on This Week in Law. Um, (laughs) Hey, my mom's watching. Oh, good, good. She'll enjoy the story then. Um, About, you wrote it up on your case, I assume, or on your blog, I assume she reads that too. Yeah, she, so yeah, she, there's I've got two readers. If you if you saw it, and she saw the case, or she saw my summary too. So yeah, that's right. Uh, um, so we've got a woman who's suing her employer uh, for sexual harassment, claiming that there is a hostile work environment at her place of employ because um, she is exposed to things like pornography on there, among other things. I mean, I don't know if there are other allegations that she was harassed verbally, but she claims she saw porn on, um, on work machines. And she claims, now this is an instance of bad lawyering on her lawyer's part, I think, uh, because she came out in the case and said, in fact, the only place I've ever seen porn is on the work computers. Now, wholly unnecessary to her success on her harassment claim was that assertion. And it opened the door wide for the other side's lawyer to say, oh, really? Well, we'd like to uh, probe your credibility on that issue, ma'am. So fork over your home computers because we'd like to see if there's any porn there. Uh, What happened, Evan? Right. Well, um, the the outcome was good if you're thinking about it in terms of her privacy interest. Uh, But Mm -hmm. it really was just a continuation of perhaps not the best lawyering that on on the uh, uh, on the requesting party side, it would be the defendants. So maybe there wasn't great lawyering on either side here. I don't want to, I don't want to turn this into a commentary on how well the lawyers did in this case, but um, the court, the appellate court found that she did not have to turn over her computers to the, uh, to the other side, but it wasn't because of some magical, uh, wonderful privacy interest she had here. It was because um, the requests uh, to to see this stuff weren't specific enough, and the trial court didn't co- you know force the parties to think about a protective order, which is a mechanism whereby uh, there is a procedure set out about you know is there going to be a new, uh, like a third party computer forensics expert to do the capturing of the information and the culling, and are we going to you know look for search terms or uh, is there going to be some kind of independent review of all this? It was all very slipshod. Uh, in in the manner in which the request was made, and uh, there there weren't a lot of the points that Texas law requires for there to be precise discovery requests and the and the the privacy protections to be put in place here. So, even though the court decided that she didn't have to turn over her computer for forensic inspection to the other side in this case, um, the we can't conclude from that decision that a similarly situated party would be afforded the same relief uh, if the other side, the requesting party, were more precise and did comport with what's expected of litigants in these types of electronic discovery situations to make requests in an appropriate way and for the court to implement the appropriate um, safeguards on the privacy interests of the uh, of the party who's producing the information. So, again, at the, uh, uh, as you said, Denise, I think the, the real uh, issue uh, in the case, the real uh, moral lesson to be learned is if you don't need to uh, swear uh, that you've never seen poor porn before, uh, don't do that because you're just going to raise up the issue for some uh, rather salacious kinds of inquiry that uh, could em- embarrass you and uh, needlessly multiply the expense of uh, you know the litigation. <laughs> Right. I mean, otherwise, if she hadn't opened the door, there would be no sort of opportunity to be digging around on her home computers in connection with a sexual harassment case. So uh, interesting outcome there. I'm glad uh, the court wanted things to be um, respectful of the plaintiff's privacy in a way that they weren't as set up. Uh, Let's talk about, oh, well, here's, here's a nice backlash trend happening. Um, It must have been like a year ago, we kept seeing case after case of 
people uh, being held or prosecuted for filming the police. Um, they would whip out their cell phone, take some video of something happening in front of them, uh, whether it was innocuous or newsworthy, and have things like wiretapping laws used to um, have their video confiscated or otherwise get them in trouble. Um, now we're seeing uh, some, uh, the table's definitely turning and, and some opposite kinds of decisions. Um, uh, we have somebody who was subject to one of these arrests. Um, he is in New York. He's now suing Suffolk County and one of the officers involved uh, for violating his First Amendment's his First Amendment rights in just one of these um, kinds of occasions, he was intercepted and arrested. Uh, his name is Philip Datz. He was a professional photojournalist, and now he's filed a civil suit. He's not seeking damages, um, only injunctive relief, barring Suffolk County police officers from interfering with the First Amendment rights of the public and the press. And then not too far from New York in Connecticut, uh, a law has passed their house and is headed for their Senate that will allow people to do what Mr. Datz has done here. So apparently it's already okay in New York to sue individual police officers for violations of First Amendment rights. So I don't have too much more to add to that. It's just interesting that, you know, as these cases have been in the news, um, that people are beginning to be up in arms about citizen journalists having their rights seized. Um, Evan, any thoughts? Oh, just isn't it amazing how there's no end to liberal hand-wringing, taking a good thing too far. I mean, we've already mm -hmm. got the First Amendment to protect these interests. You don't need an additional law that's going to, um, you know, stymie law enforcement efforts and make it more difficult than what it already is. I mean, I'm all for you know the the freedom of of speech and the and the transparency that the police should be put under and i think that in in every situation unless there's very clear lines of demarcation that are crossed where it's not appropriate to be interfering with the investigation that you ought to be free to do that but a law that says that you can go after these cops individually is not going to serve the public interest it's going to make the police more scared that their personal assets are on the line and they're not going to effectively protect the public safety so i think that law should uh I hope that the uh, state legislature, wherever that was out east, I hope they, I hope they reject that. It's Connecticut. Brandon, what do you think? Is this just political grandstanding on the legislators' parts, or do the police really need to recognize that they've been overreaching and they should be stopped? Um, I think uh, I'm, I'm with Evan. I don't see a need to uh, bring the personal liability into it too much for the, the, the police. I mean, I think it's it's great to be able to um, to uh, protect First Amendment rights and, and for citizens to be able to keep a watchful eye on the police. But um, I don't know if, if, if the proposed bill is exactly the right way to go about it. All right. Travis, any thoughts on this one? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, again, I'm, I'm with Evan and Brandon bringing in uh, another law to um, just add to the First Amendment right that's already there. Um, just shouldn't happen. We don't want to add law upon law that could complicate things. But at the same time, you know, uh, just the fact that this is up for discussion and, um, you know, up for public debate um, is a good thing. Just making making police aware of um, their, their general responsibility to respect the constitutional rights of everyone is always a good thing. And, um, and you know, if it if it makes having to respect constitutional rights makes the police's job a little bit more cumbersome or if anyone complains about that. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we've seen in history that uh, they just kind of become a part of standard procedure over the years. Uh, if you look at the development of criminal procedure over, you know, the past century and such and uh, the revolution in, you know, uh, search and seizure, Fourth Amendment rights and such, you know, having your Miranda rights read to you is pretty standard, but I'm sure 50 years ago, people might have complained that that made uh, the job uh, of law enforcement a little harder, but uh, it's always good just to, uh, to, to keep uh, constitutional rights at the fore, and um, is my opinion, and uh, the police will, should be able to adjust 
to, to that after a little while. Yeah, it's interesting that the arresting officer is a defendant uh, in the Dats case in New York. Michael Milton is the officer there. Um, the complaint was filed here. Let me get to the end of it and see the date. April 11th. So, I mean, there still could be time for someone to ride in and argue that he's not a proper defendant in the case uh, because of the sovereign immunity that generally attaches to police officers in the carrying out of their duties. Um, but uh, we shall see. There there are exceptions to the scope of that immunity, so maybe he is going to stay in. But uh, Right, and, and you're kind of hitting on a point of why a, mm-hmm. a statute that specifically criminalizes that behavior on the cops is mm-hmm. unnecessary because one of the, the requirements for that immunity that police officers generally enjoy is that um, you know that their conduct is not clearly violative of some constitutional right. So if if they can get sued and they can defend themselves, saying, "Well, you know, it wasn't really clear whether me doing this to this um, suspect who I was arrested was constitutional was a constitutional violation," then I have this immunity. But if they start violating rights, you know, very flagrantly. Um, then, you know, they, they don't have that immunity. So right. it's one other reason why the protections are already there. And those protections of the First Amendment seem to be getting more and more pronounced. You know, we've got that First Circuit decision out of Massachusetts where the guy was in the Boston Commons and all that stuff. So we're going to get to a state where it's just beyond any reasonable dispute, despite whatever what Judge Posner may say here in the Seventh Circuit. You know, we're going to get to a point where it's just beyond any reasonable dispute that this uh, filming of police activity is protected by the First Amendment, I hope. Yeah. Well, we've already had one good tip for you all in this show involving uh, you don't need to say you've never seen porn unless you feel like giving over your home computer to back it up um, or any other evidence that could be given as to where your porn viewing uh, takes place. But um, goodness gracious, Cash Hill has written up this um, Incident, <laughs> Judge Wade McCree in Detroit. Guys, have you guys uh, been paying attention to this? Uh, the the judge who is the most buffed out uh, jurist I've ever seen. He um, apparently texted a picture of himself from the waist up to a married court bailiff, uh, and he is just not apologetic at all about this. Um, he, and you know, maybe he, he works out a lot and is just proud of himself, but, uh, Fox, yeah, I think so. Mm. Fox news went and, uh, interviewed him in his chambers and he's like, uh, hot dog. Yep. That's me was his exact <laughs> quote <laughs> when he saw the picture of himself and he's joking around with his secretary about it. And, uh, the, the husband of the married bailiff did not find it funny at all. Um, so I, I guess to turn this into a tip, um, you know, hopefully judges know not to text even half naked pictures of themselves to anybody that they work with. And then the, uh, the other tip that I was able to draw out of the coverage on this is um, in the Fox News broadcast, uh, the married husband of the poor court bailiff um, went on camera and was talking about the judge. But in doing so, he, you know, had his back to the camera so you couldn't see his face. They disguised his voice. And what he was saying in his disguised voice was, when you look at these photos, you can see that the judge is not who he appears. So my other tip is if you're going to go on the news and talk about people, people being who they are, what they appear to be, don't disguise your voice and face at, in the process. Uh, so so our Michigan uh, folks, what's the, the word on Judge McCree in your neck of the woods? Travis? Um. You know, I, I I did not hear of that story. I actually had the uh, uh, pleasure of, of meeting Judge um, McCree uh, during an award ceremony uh, in my graduation. I I uh, but um, I don't have a comment on on that. <laughs> yeah, you guys may have to appear before yeah. him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, you'll be fully clothed when you do so. Brandon, any comments you want to toss out here? 
Uh, no, no comment. I'm sure he's a really <laughs> <good one. laughs> all right. Well, for anyone more interested, there's a link to the um, Fox News story over at Cash Hill's site on Forbes. Uh, it's a pretty entertaining um, run all around. Evan, you tweeted this. Uh, anything you want to add? Judge McCree is the. I don't. I, I can't decide if he's the Daddy Mac or the Mac Daddy. It's really, <laughs> it's, it's really, <laughs> it's really pretty awesome. He's just, I mean. Well, he's sexy I'm and he for, knows it is the thing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, he's he, he's a, he's a honey badger. He he doesn't care. Um, <laughs> you know, it's I love lambasting judges whenever I can. You know, and I mean, I'm I'm here giggling about Judge McCree and and I and really, it's 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 probably an ethics violation. He's probably you know whatever not uh, what, whatever the standard is. He probably you know he should be somehow. Um, censured or something like that. I mean, you know, but judges do some some really bad stuff that's not worth, uh, you know, laughing about. I mean, there was that YouTube video that went viral sometime in 2011 of that judge in Texas beating the hell out of his daughter with a belt. I mean, that's not worth laughing at at all. Uh, it suffice it to say that judges are humans and they do uh, dumb stuff. They make mistakes. And, you know, there clearly is a spectrum of, of behavior um, but it doesn't obscure the fact that judges are, um, you know, held to a higher standard and we've got to take this uh, stuff seriously. It's just uh, kind of harder to take it seriously when it's uh, when it's funny, you know, it really yeah. is funny. Absolutely. OK, well, as our resource of the week, uh, I, I know that, that probably giving presents to lawyers is on the top of everybody's list who's listening to the show, watching the show. Uh, but day. over on Google Plus, Don Wood asked me, uh, he has a friend who is a new law graduate who, like Brandon and Travis, had 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 some other career activities before they went to law school. So um, they're, they're not necessarily in their early 20s. Um, and he wants to know what he should get this new law grad friend of his. And uh, I wanted to just toss this out since we have a couple of new law graduates on uh, the panel today and get your guys' ideas. When you buy a present for a lawyer or specifically a new law grad, uh, where do you go and what do you think is a good idea? What do you think, Travis? Well, for a recent law grad, maybe the best present would be a job. <laughs> but uh, um, not to make light of the uh, the the situation that was faced by uh, my class, it, it's gotten a little better um, over uh, you know th this uh, class of 2012 uh, seems to have fared a lot better than 2011, and I'm sure following classes will do great. But as far as a recent grad, what you know, they would appreciate is the massive uh, something to address the uh, massive expense and the uh, the um, big event coming up right after law school, which is uh, the bar exam. So uh, perhaps uh, getting getting the recent grad a uh, some sort of bar study um, some sort of bar study uh, resource would be great. I have some suggestions if you would like or if I don't want to endorse anyone specifically. But uh, just get them a bar study book or help them pay for their bar study, uh, bar study course. Uh, it's always a good thing. I knew uh, in my own experience, I thought it was a rather absurd amount of money to have to pay for this stack of books that I was only going to spend three months with. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I don't think people who haven't gone to law school and take the bar exam, taken the bar exam, I don't think they really realize that, that you desperately need one of these classes even after you've gone to law school because the bar is its own beast, its own test that really law school doesn't uh, unfortunately prepare you for all that well. Uh, I like the idea of, you know, if you've got the money to burn on it, not just um, providing hey, a... audio? Uh, who's this? Travis? Uh, or uh, Brandon? No, You're good. Okay. Um, not just providing a bar review course, but um, there are a lot of apps available now that, that do that. So, you know, in an iPad or iPhone kind of arena, um, you could be studying 
basically anywhere you are. So it would be a good supplement to. Uh, unfortunately, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. I remember driving down to Mexico when I was studying for the bar exam and studying in the back of the car. You're studying all the time when you're studying for the bar exam. Um, I had some other ideas. There are some uh, fun web- websites out there that do sort of gag gifts or fun lift, uh, fun gifts. There's the four council site where you can find the um, billable hour watch, which breaks down the hour into six minute increments. Oh, fancy. Uh, there's the billable hour site, which has uh, things like um, little bibs for babies of uh, husband and wife lawyers that, uh, that say things like uh, attorney work product, um, there are all kinds of uh, yeah. There are all kinds of funny um, options out there. Uh, maybe if if uh, your bank account is not feeling terribly strong, but you want to send them a good laugh, um, you could point them to the Facebook group that is Bar Exam Law Cats, which are hysterical um, people studying for the bar, trying to blow off steam, and creating Law Cats related to their torts class, um, just not to be missed. Uh, Evan, you have any thoughts? Uh, probably psychotherapy to help them deconstruct <laughs> the ass hattery that they've ingested for the previous three years. It's the best I can think of. Yeah, that would be a welcome gift. How about you, Brandon? Uh, yeah, I, I'd go towards the same area of not, uh, not bar study, but before bar study and either vacation trip or even, uh, just get someone a video game. They can sit down with and play 20 hours a day to, uh, decompress <laughs> from three years of law school. That's right. Well, uh, we heard on Twitter from, um, I'm not sure who tweeted this to us exactly, but they were sitting there playing Halo and watching Twill. So maybe you can make that. <laughs> Recommendation. <laughs> All right, guys, this has been a really, really fun show. Um, great to meet you, Travis and Brandon. Uh, keep up the great work with Creative Rights. Travis, anything you want to leave listeners and viewers with before you go? Um, yeah, just uh, if you're, you're a member of the creative community and uh, you're interested in what we do, our services we provide, again, uh, our website you see right there is www.creative-rights.org. And uh, yeah, go blue. <laughs> Reference to Michigan, of course. Uh, Brandon, any last words for us? Uh, no, I'll just say thanks again for having us on, giving us this opportunity. Sure. Um, now, when you guys uh, have something on Twitter or Google+, Plus, let us know because uh, we're happy to plug that too. I don't think uh, there's anything for people to follow at this point. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. So we'll keep an eye out for you on the social networking scene. Uh, you can find Evan over at Internet Cases on Twitter. Evan, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. This is uh, a wonderful time. Brandon, Travis, you guys are doing really cool things over in Michigan. Really nice to talk with you. So good luck. Keep up the uh, the good work. It's great to see you uh, being innovative in uh, helping creative people, even in the uh, face of these trying economic times. So uh, nice to talk with you. Oh, and thanks, here's Evan. another Here's a late addition to our resource of the week from Titus in IRC at uh, the wonderful Above the Law blog. Uh, there is a post, the bar exam, a list of famous failures, people who have famously failed the bar, such as, I'm sure I haven't looked at the list, but Kathleen Sullivan, former dean of Stanford Law School, failed the California bar on her first time out. I'm sure she's on there somewhere. It's easy to do. Like I said, you really have to study for those tests uh, specifically. Um, All right. So uh, it's been a wonderful show, guys. I hope that uh, you enjoyed the show as well and that you join us between the shows. Uh, We've got a Facebook page you should check out and a Google Plus page. You can send me an email, denise at twit.tv. Let us know what's on your mind. We love hearing from you. And uh, you can check out the whole archive of our shows at twit.tv slash twill. And catch us live when we record every Friday at 11 o'clock Pacific Time, 1800 UTC at twit.tv. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.